little bit from the beginning. We had uh, a lab happening down in Melbourne, Australia, and various um, things have been happening over the last couple of years to sort of bring this forward. So hello, Dan Winter. <laughs> Thanks, Roger. Roger's been our hero in sponsoring conferences and events with us for longer than I can remember. It's 20 to 30 years, and we're both still young. That's the amazing part. <laughs> That's right. Getting younger. <laughs> we did many, you know, round-the-continent tours of Australia together, and then Roger's family in New Zealand. This has been amazing. Roger's been central to so many things. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Glad to be here. Dan Winter, fractalfield.com. Most people know me out there, uh, electrical engineer, systems analyst with IBM. And I'm the co-inventor of Therify, inventor of, with Patrick of RealHeartCoherence.com, with Jason, the Imploder.com, and many, many projects. Today's conversation is focused on uh, the fractality of hydrogen and why that is so profound, both in a very practical commercial energy sense for hydrolysis as a frequency signature, but even more deeply, as Roger called it, a fractal antenna in hydrogen, because that is the centerpiece of the water bond. <clears throat> so the implosion there is central to how water can become cosmic when it's embedded in a vortex, for example, and it's central to every DNA ladder rung codon bond, the center of the zipper, as it were. And that makes that antenna fractality also profound, because what's happening is at the center of that fractal vortex that is hydrogen, you get a squirt gun in to what we call longitudinal interferometry, the, the interferometry, the, the compression wave, which is sort of like DNA radio eventually to the universe, and the physics of gravity waves. So by, because hydrogen is so profoundly tuned as a fractal antenna, not only does that inform us of, of potential energy technologies, which are amazing, and we're going to tell you now about it, but it also explains how when hydrogen is nested in recursive braiding in water, for example, and then that short wave fractality is embedded in longer and longer waves, also in phase discipline, that phase conjugate cascade then implodes through to the Planck threshold and compresses out in the longitudinal array, the collective unconscious, as it were, DNA radio, and literally the physics of gravity waves, if you believe Bearden's equations. And so that connection to that very long wave radio, DNA radio, and interstellar gravity waves all starts with, in hydrogen, in water, and in DNA, all starts with understanding the profound fractality of hydrogen itself and how it's assembled. I see on YouTube today there's just a new uh, video out on perfect self-reference in the construction of matter and atoms. So it, many physicists are getting onto the idea that perfected self-reference, perfected self-similarity, perfected embedding is precisely the, the ingredient of the constructive uh, motor which allows the assembly of matter itself. So that's the context of today's conversation. Now, to begin this, um, I'm going to use a PowerPoint actually that Roger was kind enough to put together, which was an introduction to a hydrolysis project we set up in Melbourne years ago. PowerPoint hydrogen from Roger. So let's see if this works. <clears throat> and so this was just an introduction to the hydrogen antenna project. Roger was brave enough to come there and help co-sponsor what we did there in, in Melbourne. So we set up a preliminary lab to do the testing. And we had preliminary success, but there are issues that have to do with the, the antenna to radiate, to trigger and tickle and whisper to the hydrogen bond, which I'm going to explain right now. <laughs> so this was an enhanced electrolysis and hydrogen production experiment. Dramatic reduction in the power required to split hydrogen, which is the core of our hydrogen antenna project. It's actually splitting hydrogen from water. And if you can do that efficiently, that's the end of all energy problems on planet Earth and a few other things. It's pretty cool. So releasing hydrogen for, from water by using a precise equation. It was my equation. We're going to show you. Planck times integer exponents of golden ratio, perfect phase conjugate fractality. Origin of negentropy is the title of my book using that equation. So that predicted a set of wavelengths and frequency harmonics, which you will see profoundly predict the structure of hydrogen and how to whisper to it. You know, instead of the horse whisperer, <laughs> we had the hydrogen whisperer. And you're going to see that that equation then predicted what others had done to whisper to hydrogen, notably Kansius. So a unique frequency signature causes implosive hydrolysis. So... <clears throat> uh, 
we are going to use that, that frequency cascade to trigger, it's an actually called an RF longitudinal or circularly polarized antenna to whisper to water. So instead of broadly slamming the water molecule with an offset voltage for hydraulic, like, you know, normally hydrolysis, you take, connect a battery to plates and you've got one simple biased DC voltage and that will eventually coax the, water, the hydrogen molecule off the water molecule. But the power, the wattage required to do that creates great limitations. Conventional hydrolysis is basically not commercializable in the sense that, well, the wattage it takes to make the hydrogen doesn't quite equal the energy you get from that hydrogen. If you use simply DC, which is what Roger here refers to as a broad slamming the water instead of singing to it. So the history of this kind of research, um, we're going to show you the picture of, you know, Kansas has this cold glass of water burning beautifully with a simple radio frequency field, and we're going to explain a bit how that worked. And then there's the famous Omasa in Japan, and there's a parallel, and uh, we have partners now who are deep, and we're deep partners of Omasa, and there's a parallel. Also, there's a parallel Roger didn't mention, but in the Joe cell, and we may have some pictures here also, the concentric metal tubes, which we form a circular capacitor, circular cylindrical metal tubes, properly biased voltage, make an implosive capacitor, as in the famous Joe cell, Lismore, Australia. And indeed, that was another example, a very specialized form of hydrolysis, where that the hydrogen gas comes off like an organized plasma, sometimes called mag gas or Joe cell gas or uh, HHO. There's lots of names for it. But the thing is, that hydrogen plasma that comes off has very interesting quote-unquote self-organizing syrupy qualities which are beautiful powerful and can be dangerous because there's so much energy in it so the nature of the self-organizing plasma that emerges from hydrogen HHO magna gas lots of names for that is something that well, once you understand the negentropic nature of the bond that formed that plasma you get a clue so it, Roger's introducing here the scope of the experiments and benchmarks. We set an RF fractal wave antenna. Actually, it, it's, technically it wasn't a fractal antenna. It was RF circularly polarized. And we'll explain more and show you maybe some pictures here. And so you have, you're going to see some pictures of the laboratory. So yes, see, once you accomplish this very efficient way to tickle and whisper to the hydrogen bond, obviously, and you can generate large-scale amounts of hydrogen, very energy efficiently, obviously, it becomes very scalable and it becomes an immediate dramatic solution to the energy crisis. And everyone's always recognized that, but no one has recognized how to accurately whisper to that hydrogen bond. And that's the subject of this conversation. Yes, and central, <clears throat> central to that is, is the golden ratio. And I'm going to show you the slides of how I, how I discovered the golden ratio physics of the three main hydrogen radii from my new equation. I'm going to show you the pictures in a minute. So that the actual uh, uh, golden sections which form the concentric radii of hydrogen predicts the frequencies both that Kansas used and now we know why. We also know why and how to optimize that longitudinal wave. We know for example what Kansas didn't. That if you use uh, an array of longitudinally or circularly polarized RF antennas you can do this like you know the miracle of sacred space. So you know, when you set up RF antennas, as Rogers mentioned here, there's, there's some very critical issues that have to do with impedance matching between the power of the amplifier and the antenna. The thing is, now we understand so much more about that because we now know uh, how to optimize circularly polarized antenna. So that we're testing to prove and the feasibility of doing this um, uh, capacitively what's called high dielectric material. I've talked about that in many other presentations. Basically, High dielectric means the material in the capacitor that's ringing to produce the field effect, if that material is a high dielectric constant, which means charge distribution efficiency, technically defined as ratio of permittivity, the ratio of the permittivity, the distribution efficiency, of the material in the dielectric resistance in the capacitor as ratio to the permittivity of the vacuum. That ratio is defined as dielectric constant. So basically, you need charge distribution efficiency in order to radiate these waves efficiently and that's the same physics which later will be discussed in this conference on the physics of biologic architecture. For the same reason, you need capacitance to be distributed efficiently in your house, meaning wood, stone, natural fabric, because they have high dielectric. 
And the reason natural material have high dielectric constant, for the same reason in the capacitor, is because life pushes molecules into the fractality, which makes charge distribution efficient, and therefore, that means they read my bumper sticker, which says get fractal or get dead. <laughs> So uh, the geometry and frequency was something I developed and worked on. I'm going to show you the slides of the intellectual history of that discovery and the palladium frequency here. This is one of the frequencies here, 13.56 megahertz, which miraculously fits my equation, Planck times integer exponents of golden ratio, that they tripped over, and we now know why and how to optimize. So Roger sharing here some of the pictures from our Melbourne laboratory. The top is on uh, left is an Anton cell which we tested for efficient hydrolysis, normally used only in DC hydrolysis. And so we're setting up here, this is the um, RF amplifier that I located that then uh, we used here in Australia and in Melbourne. And actually, the RF amp here is here in the middle right, uh, and the bottom is a DC high voltage source. Here is a, um, uh, 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 there's a gigahertz spectrum analyzer here, and uh, a DC power amp, and an arbitrary waveform generator. So we can generate a harmonic cascade all the way through the RF very accurately and in phase, which is not an easy thing technologically to do. You can make a, you know, a sonic cascade in a free software on your computer, but if you want to make an RF cascade, a whole heart series of RF harmonics accurately and in phase, you need some fairly sophisticated gear. This is uh, <clears throat> pictures uh, <laughs> with Roger in playtime. Here we are in uh, in the lab in Marseille with uh, Jean-Paul Biberian, who's the, Europe's leading co uh, fusion physicist and former physics leader at University of Marseille, and has a beautiful lab where he does cold fusion research. And with us here on the left is uh, Elizabeth Donovan, who is one of our lead uh, electrical engineer and theorists that Roger and I have been working with many years, and I believe Elizabeth will be sharing with us in this. Uh, <laughs> so here we are in the lab, this, in this case in Marseille. So this is the core, one of the core images here, and it was nice that Roger did a screen grab for you. You can find all over the web and YouTube uh, videos of this. So he, basically what this is, is this is a glass of cold water, which is burning beautifully. And you say, well, how does cold water burn beautifully? And all that's happening here is an RF antenna is shooting a radio frequency at the water. Now everybody knows the frequency, but people don't understand why that RF wave had to be longitudinal or circularly polarized. And that's the, the fun, the drama. And maybe I'm going to stop the screen share at the end of that. So the, the physics of longitudinal waves is basically essential to all of the subject areas we, we teach, whether it's the cause of gravity or whether it's the cause of centripetal forces, whether it's the cause of healing in Therify. Always, always, always the conversation resolves to understanding what an electromagnetic longitudinal wave is, actually. And, and physics is, this is still very controversial in physics. Uh, many people call it scalar or torsional. Uh, but think about it rationally, just simply for a moment. We'll have more pictures in a moment. But normally your electromagnetic wave, your AM and FM radio, for example, the wave motion is going up and down per perpendicular to the direction of propagation. That's called transverse electromagnetic. However, uh, in sound waves and in longitudinal electromagnetics, a, a longitudinal EMF wave, the wave of compression is going parallel to the direction of propagation. That's called compressional or longitudinal, which is the nature of most sound waves. And it's interesting, you, people use a tsunami as a metaphor to explain the difference. In some, tsunami in the ocean, you, you don't even know when it passed under your boat because it's longitudinal, compressional, okay? But when it gets to the shoreline, the cone of that shoreline, the, the curve of that shoreline, pushes that compressional wave up, and now it's vertical, and the wave inertia is perpendicular to the direction of propagation, hence a transverse, in that case, ocean wave, and that's what'll kill you when it hits the shore. <laughs> well, well, the reason that tsunami can travel faster than a jet plane under the water is because it's a compressional wave. That introduces you to some of the physics here. Well, supposing you're an atom, supposing you're a hydrogen atom. Uh, actually, uh, background here, the first uh, 
Nuclear devices were called implosion because you had to focus the compressional waves, in this case the explosive devices around Fat Boy and the first nuclear bombs, you had to focus the compressional waves accurately toward center to make it implode. That means here you are at the center of the compression. Maybe you're a hydrogen atom. Now, if the wave coming at you is transverse, going up and down like this, imagine what happens when that wave hits the ping pong ball or the billiard ball called the hydrogen atom. So the wave's going up and down. What's that going to do to that center? A little bit of wiggle this way, but it's not compressional, which means it cannot effectively direct its inertia toward implosive center. So in other words, it cannot be part of a centering force. And everything, everything we do in all of our technologies is about restored centering force, whether you call it restoring centripetal, whether you call it implosion, whether you call it negentropy, it's all about restoring centripetal force. Remember, all of our lectures are quite clear Centripetal force is the only real definition of life force electrically in a seed or a house. Centripetal force implosion is the only definition of bliss in your brain waves. Centripetal force is the only de definition of implosion in water and big entropy. Centripetal force is, is, centripetal force restored is gravity restored. So you see, when the centripetal force can be restored, implosion can be restored, it means the compression waves have to focus at center centripetally, and the transverse wave that ain't going to cut it, because it's just going to bounce that billiard ball up and down a little bit, but instead you want a perfect squeeze. If you want to know the f physics, just study a well-designed tomato juicer, which says you could not get a better squeeze. So we, we, we do need the perfect squeeze in order to restore the centripetal force. And that's how you sing to a hydrogen atom, because that's how hydrogen atoms were designed. Okay. So now that's, that leads us very nicely to the next part of this where I show you the sort of math background of my discoveries about the geometry of the hydrogen atom. And so that we want to go to an article called goldenmean.info slash goldenproof, which is, uh, let's see here. I think I set that up here. Let me see if I can do this right. Keynote, keynote, keynote. Right. So I'm going to a website goldenmean.info slash goldenproof. Now, are you, you should be seeing the hydrogen radii in angstroms on your screen, I hope. That's correct, Dad. We can see it. Wonderful. Good. So this is the web article, goldenmean.info slash goldenproof, which is the first article I produced after I made the discovery. So these are the numbers on the right in the literature of the three critical radii of hydrogen in angstroms, 0 0.28, 0 0.46, and 0.74 angstroms the three critical radii of cationic and anionic radii of hydrogen. And here is my equation and my original discovery that those numbers, super accurate, like 99.9 something, are predicted accurately by my new equation, LP Planck times integer exponents of golden ratio. In this case, 116, 117, 118 powers of golden ratio predicted those radii. Now, there's no physicist who could ever, ever say that's an accident or that's a coincidence. No, 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 no. That is fractality or phase conjugation perfected. And that's what we want to talk about here. So, uh, this is, your local physicist says it's critically important that every student at Planck length and time quantize. Uh, but if that quantizes the fractality, then that means that Fractality, based on golden ratio, is the reason hydrogen exists. And that's profound here. So here's an animation I made years ago, which only more recently did I discover here that I'm precisely animating. And I don't know how fast this animation is playing on your screen. depends on bandwidth. But you see how the side view of that geometry is called the caduceus. So that is hydrogen imploding right there in front of you. And th this shows that my equation also, many of you know, predicted so accurately also these only two frequencies that cause photosynthesis. So the purple and orange light which make photosynthesis happen also are very narrow frequency bands precisely predicted by my equation, 427 and 691 nanometers, proving photosynthesis like hydrogen exists precisely because of phase conjugate fractality to Planck, tuned to Planck as it were. This is a uh, the, you, most of you have seen this is old news. So here's my equation here in blue, 
the frequencies 2.7844.57.211.819. Those are the frequencies in blue predicted by my equation, Planck times global ratio. Now down below, the Schumann harmonics, 3, 7.80, 14.3, we have bingo, 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 almost. Meaning the reason Gaia is negentropic, as Lovelock proved, is precisely because the Schumann cascade is phase conjugate to Planck almost, which then explains that we were talking earlier about how pyramid frequencies cause the pyramid to ring piezoelectrically, and you can harness that implosion in the piezo pyramid to project a longitudinal wave and make a global wireless power grid from what the pyramids do by resonating piezoelectrically precisely to the Schumann harmonic cascade. And it looks like this, and it's very romantic. In fact, I think it's a valentine. <laughs> and this is another picture of the same thing. And here's another animation of the same thing. We have lots of movies. I was playing with, you know, we, when I, I was setting up the lab at Gaia TV, and I had all these animation tools to play with. So anyway, this uh, is from Nature magazine saying the universe is dodecahedral, and New Scientist saying the universe is fractal. If you arrange the, the, inter, the arrangement of masses around the universe, one magazine says it's fractal, the other magazine says it's dodeca, and now we know why. And we have, as they say on the side of the school bus, too many movies, too little time. But the, uh, we need, and that's, this is the Grail animation series. Many of you have seen that. And we'll just play that for a moment. But I want to get to the section then on the history of the mathematics of my discovery. The, the visualizations are romantic, though, you got to admit. And there's a new professional video series here, goldenbean.info slash grail, about the implications. And it's a beautiful thing. And how it happens in the blood. And it's, it's all fun and pretty. And you can see why I wanted to use this article, because we had some of our prettiest pictures. <laughs> and here is precise golden ratio fractality defining the Mandelbrot set. So you see why the, why the Mandelbrot set works. It's the perfect fractal because it uses golden ratio, not the other way around. Now there's a whole explanation of this from uh, 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 Garrett Lisi and the E8 story, which is too much for this conversation. Uh, there's a picture below though, of E8, which is so romantic. Wait, I just got to that one go. Uh, here's Garrett Lisi's E8 is a beautiful, yeah, here it is. Isn't that gorgeous? Basically, this is a superstellation of the Star Mother kit. And Garrett Lisi defined from E8, which is almost all based on golden ratio, and he got as, as a subset the table of virtually every subatomic particle in the subatomic particle zoo, all from golden ratio E8. It was very cool. Okay, so the main reason I dug out this particular web article is right here. So here's my equation, Planck length times golden ratio, and here's the three radii of hydrogen I predicted. And in the article, I refer to the antecedent scientist who I must acknowledge named Hayrovska, whose work I looked at to start my work. And so here's Hayrovska's work. And what Hayrovska basically showed was the ratio between those radii was golden ratio. So he had drawn this picture right here and said, oh look, if you take the ratio between hydrogen radii, golden ratio is written all over hydrogen. Don't click on that, Dan. Sorry. Here we go. Don't want to lose our place here. So Hayrovska drew the picture that said hydrogen has golden ratio written all over it. So that was not new, in new information when I started. I added one specific insight, however, which was how does that fit with respect to center? So once I knew that hydrogen radii, and there's, a, there's many articles about golden ratio and, hi, and hydrogen, I'm showing you some of them here. First excited state, that when hydrogen is excited, which is when the electron shells unpack and unfold like a rose, they use golden ratio to unfold in an orderly way. That also is known and not new information. So I added only one specific but very important piece of information, which was that if you take those radii and calculate distance to center, and my insight was to use Planck to, to, as the frame of reference, which then to multiply to get those radii. That was my new piece of information. My insight was, oh, if those radii are golden ratio between them, they must be focused on something at center. And I had the insight at that point, obviously, it could be nothing but Planck. And so then I tested to see by using inverse logarithmic algebra. Okay, so there's stop sheet. So that's just a little background on how I discovered golden ratio is the center 
of the radii that were already known to be golden ratio between them in the structure of hydrogen, making hydrogen perfectly self-similar, perfectly self-embedding, perfectly phase conjugate, perfectly fractal, and tuned to Planck. And the fact that I was able to use Planck to do that established the tuning for the whole cascade as it were. So, let's see how we do it in time. So it's about three, three. So there's two sets of visuals now, unless you uh, we have some questions in the meantime, either way is fine. Uh, we'll take questions later, Dan. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So the next visuals are from, uh, there's so many keynotes here. We need to go to the keynote called Longitudinal Compressed, which is right here. And we need image set number 16 to 24. I'm digging around and doing my homework. Uh, is this longitudinal? No, that's full sequence. Get that out of there. Longitudinal Compressed. Okay. You should be seeing... Uh, slide that says, how does that phase conjugate fractal compression? <clears throat> make the slide full screen. Is that possible? Um, there's a... Did you hear that? Yeah. Uh, can you make it into full screen? Uh, perhaps would be better. At least I can make it a little bit bigger, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I have some screen... <laughs> Double click on the main screen. Yeah, but there's other things happening here that limit my ability. <laughs> Just one minute. Uh, anyway, that's pretty good. We can, we can see that. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's issues here that is very complicated because there's multiple things happening. I'm sorry about that. But I hope you can see it. So um, the purpose of this slide is, uh, and most of you have seen me even have this discussion before, but basically... When the radii use golden ratio ac accurately, and obviously those radii are describing vortex. Everything about the atomic table is a nest of vortex. There's nothing else there. And the nest of vortex, sometimes, sometimes called string theory, worm, wormhole, lots of names for it. But it is about arranging the vortex. And it's in fact a plasma vortex because it's a charge vortex. So this is quite literally a model of the vortex that is hydrogen, clearly. For example, when the vortex nests accurately, this is called four-wave mixing in phase conjugate optics and how you get neg entropy for the first time measured ever in laser optics, phase conjugate optics. So making those vortex nest accurately is the problem that golden ratio solves. The point I want to make here is now that we know that the vortex, which is hydrogen, is using golden ratio all the way to center here, specifically in this gap at the center, if you can see my little arrow, that tip of the pine cone, this, the size of the tip of the toothpaste tube is Planck length, 1.61 times 10 to the minus 33 centimeter. And at that threshold, the tuning is because the inertia that entered from the outside on the left is a transverse wave. But because of golden ratio caduceus optimized translation of vorticity, only possible because of golden ratio, perfected heterodyne, the up and down inertia is translated without loss of inertia into a compressional wave on the right in this case called a longitudinal wave, longitudinal EMF, which we will later prove by equation, thanks to Tom Bearden, is the physics of gravity waves and many other things, including almost every healing device out there and including the reason hydrogen makes gravity and including the reason hydrogen can spit out a plasma field which appears to be self-organizing like syrup, as Joe Sell predicted. All because the throat of this vortex is spitting so accurately through the Planck threshold at the toothpaste tube. So the conversion of transverse on the left to longitudinal electromagnetic inertia precisely happens in hydrogen because it is so profoundly golden ratio to Planck, etc. And that longitudinal wave propagation is the key to everything. Efficient energy, uh, uh, energy healing at a distance, power at a distance, uh, action at a distance. You know, conventional physics says action at a distance only happens because of perfect nesting and embedding. Well, nesting and embedding uh, is the problem golden ratio conjugation solves. Now, many of you seen, have seen this slide before. So here is the golden ratio harmonic cascade. Any two numbers added equals and any number multiplied by 1.618 equals the following two. And that isn't just a solution to beauty, it's a solution to wave mechanics, because it's a solution to recursive heterodyning, therefore it is a solution to constructive compression, and therefore the solution to construct constructive compression is a solution to just about any problem you can think of. <laughs> History of computers, how to get through death, 
how to make zero point energy, how to implode hydrogen. It's all about constructive compression. History of alchemy. And it, the solution to constructive compression is the solution to, to every problem, per, you know, urban design, any problem you can think of, how to get through death, is the solution to constructive compression. So what we're going to introduce here now, um, you know, the, here's where we're saying this is the cause of gravity. Gravity exists because hydrogen can implode this way, because the way out for charge through center is longitudinal because of golden ratio to Planck. So Einstein correctly said infinite non-destructive compression is a solution to the unified field. Of course, he didn't know what a fractal was, and he didn't know that golden ratio phase conjugate compression is infinite non-destructive compression because there's a way out for charge constructively through the center into the longitudinal because it's golden ratio to Planck. That's the reason it works, and therefore that's the reason gravity works, and that's the reason all forms of negentropy work. It's the reason life force exists. It's the reason consciousness exists. It's the reason negentropy exists. And you've all seen, you've, you know, you're probably tired of <laughs> hearing me get so enthused, but so th you've seen this in my book. So this is Planck times integer exponents of golden ratio predicts three radiative hydrogen, ADP, the most important molecule in the body, the frequencies of photosynthesis, predicts all sacred dimension the British foot predicts Schumann harmonics, EEG harmonics of bliss, predicts the LF Mayer wave, the perfect breath harmonic, it predicts the Venus year, Earth year, galactic year, and processional year. And so anything that fits on that frequency cascade has the possibility of negentropy. Nothing else does, that's the point. So this is the first paper we published, credit Bill, now Elizabeth Donovan, Martin Jones. Martin Jones is a wonderful mathematician, and I, the first paper we published on this subject which is basically it's perfect compression in the hydrogen atom and phase conjugation. And in the second paper we published on this, and you can read the physics background again at these two web links shown right here, fractalfield.com slash conjugate gravity and fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy is all the physics references. And so the first paper we published is on the left, General Science Journal, Compressions of the Hydrogen Atom and Phase Conjugation. The second paper we published, thanks again to Martin Jones, is called Fractal Golden Ratio Phase Conjugation colon cause of gravity. So and basically we, we took the Klein-Gordon equations to show that waves add and multiply perfectly on a line when they're in golden ratio. And then we extrapolated that using basically the star mother kit and showing that same line existed in three dimensions in the cellular dodeca, which is the symmetry of hydrogen. And that means wave generalized wave equations prove that golden ratio solves the problem of maximum constructive interference. That's profound because that is maximum fractality, that is charge implosion, that's the origin perfection of negentropy, and the cause of gravity. This is Tom Bearden's book, which I highly recommend, but it's difficult. But it's, it, it, if you can handle a bit of math here, pointing out that not only is what he called longitudinal or scalar waves the cause of gravity waves, but it's the cause of Self-organization in biology, even theoretically, you know the old story, you put a copper square on the roof and a wire to a, a pitch black basement and the plants grow fine, because the longitudinal waves from the sun through that wire made the plants grow. It's the longitudinal wave that makes growth, because it has the potential of being centripetal. So this is the, the technical background. And again, the links to this, to Tom Bearden's site, shinier.org, that's all at fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. So, we are at slide number 24. That's the last slide in this lecture from that series. So again, background information for then how would we apply this to hydrogen? And um, Kansas used a radio frequency wave, predicted my equation, but he didn't know, for example, how to perfect the placement of those antennas. He didn't know that you could use a cascade of frequencies as long as they fit my equation, because he didn't know my equation. He didn't know, for example, in the same way that Priory, Antoine Priory, the device that was the antecedent of the heart of the therify.net did not know that you could not phase conjugate optically without oh, plasma, you can phase conjugate plasma without two, at least a pair of opposing signal sources. Any laser optics physicist can tell you, God, I have two lasers, you're never going to phase conjugate anything. Well, Antoine Priori didn't know that. And actually, uh, Kansius didn't know that, that you need pairs precisely nodally arrayed at the, the longitudinal grid nodes in order to propagate, because when the waves converge at center, they need to be precisely 180 degrees out of phase to implode. 
So there's many things that Kansius didn't know when he had the cold glass of water burning. Now we know all those things. We're building the RF antenna. You know, in RF antenna engineers, they're a pretty crotchety bunch, so this is not something you have that happens overnight. But you get that this could be quite fun. Okay. The last visual series for this lecture is in the full sequence, which is like a 500 video uh, slide series. It's called Full Sequence Keynote, Applosion Full Sequence. And it's slide number 216 to 241. So put this away here. We get full sequence. We need window. Full sequence. Here we go. Should be up there. We need bring it up here. I hope you're seeing it correctly. So we need visual number 216 to 241. This is 216. So you've seen this slide already. This is the um, Photosynthesis harmonics and Schumann harmonics and breath harmonics predict by equation. The reason I'm just showing these slides briefly is to give you a little flavor, aka intro to Glenn Ryan, for example. Supposing you took, now that you know that this, let's see, I'm going to move this up a little bit so it shows a little better here. Now that you know that this hydrogen bond here is not only the center of every water molecule, it is the center of every DNA codon ladder rung molecule. That's the zipper that implodes in DNA, and lightening up that zipper is called getting a soul. That's, my, that's the metaphor, which I think is actually useful, in the braiding DNA article. And this is all at goldenmean.info slash DNA manifesto. Point being, now we know that the center of this hydrogen bond, at the center of DNA ladder rung, we know the frequencies as in Kansas hydrolysis, we know the frequencies that hold that hydrogen bond together. Now, supposing you took that, that zipper and you ratcheted that dodeca down the helix, but then supposing you did a braid of the braid of the braid on the braid, embedding that thread into string, into rope, into fat rope. We have other visuals here. And what happens when the plot thickens, I mean, when the DNA thickens, is that set of low, of very high frequency uh, hydrogen bond frequencies, which are phase conjugate and positive negative, is then properly embedded or nested in much longer waves. You know, you get circular DNA. This is from <clears throat> geometric extensions of consciousness, where, which where some we got some of those original DNA animations uh, inspired by Ann Ting, who a very wonderful friend who published who got these. Uh, ideas about the DNA being a ratchet dodeca helix from the famous Coxeter, one of the most famous geometers of all time, and that the sequence of, of a cubic braid from to a, a lattice cobweb tunnel spiral, the, the four visions you see at the time of death, is actually how DNA is recursively braiding as the plot thickens, and that process is actually, the reason you see the lattice cobweb tunnel spiral, the geometry is seen during successful death, is because, right here, DNA is doing that in order to implode and therefore. So the point we're making in this conversation, and this is a nice introduction to Glenn Ryan's lecture later in the, in the series here, because Glenn Ryan then measured the effect of bliss, heart coherence, imploding DNA on the, the braid density within DNA a center here, center top, the density, the amount of the enzyme responsible for the zipper in DNA was right here in Glenn Ryan's measure, and he made this, uh, uh, these measurements at my su su suggestion when uh, we were together at HeartMath Institute in those early years. But just looking again at the animation, and again, this is probably playing slowly in your, depending on bandwidth, but you see that, that double helix in the side view there? Well, when the braid within the braid embedding recursion is is uh, self-similarity perfected, which is golden mean ratio perfected, then the short wave embeds in the longer wave phase coherently due to golden ratio, and then you get a much bigger frequency cascade, hint, broad spectral implosion, ensoulment, psychokinesis in DNA. Valerie's there watching her teacher float when she's praying. I mean, how do you make gravity in your DNA? Well, you got some clues here. This is more intro to Glenn Ryan. Maybe I'm a I'm doing Glenn Ryan's lecture for him, Roger. 
uh, but th this is the point that, that once I showed HeartMath Institute how to do this on the bottom left, measure heart coherence by doing a power spectrum EKG, I was the first one to do that to measure emotion. Then Glenn Ryan took my suggestion and measured that, causing DNA to braid implode. The plot thickens, the longer wave embeds, as in uh, Surfaces of Zulia by uh, Jose Argoyas, ride the long wave, Uncle Joe. And getting that long wave into, into hydrogen, for example, is definitely related to this idea about the broad spectral coherence, which is how you cohere the vacuum. Now, another way to model that, what's happening in hydrogen recursively, what we're just talking about, is also precisely emulated in the structure of the voltage wave that causes the heart to fire from the biophysics literature shown here. This is from... Uh, Arthur T. Winfrey's famous book, When Time Breaks Down the Origins of Cardiac Arrhythmia. And he's actually using probes to measure. Your three-year-old kid it asks you, what causes my heart to fire? Well, if your three-year-old child ever asks you, please show them this picture. <laughs> and in short, you, you could answer, well, I would turn myself inside out for you, darling. And, you know, talk about this metaphor. But see, that physics of perfect recursive turning inside out, donut inside donut, and you could even use one of Tufan Guven's seven color donuts to model, is what's happening at the center of hydrogen and to sing to hydrogen efficiently. And so that recursive nesting, which is starts with hydrogen, extends all the way to the heartbeat. And that's fractality in the heartbeat. And most of you guys, it's called perfect looping or super looping or perfect embedding. And so then for that reason, there's actually a three dimensional, this is supposed to play like a little bit. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm sure that's playing too fast, actually, for the screens to be grabbed. But you see, that not only is it a golden spiral, but it's spiraling cubes. Now, length, area, and volume are conserved along that single contiguous pathway, and that is precisely how implosion happens. Literally, the only possible way into the next dimension, because the next dimension is the name for the ability to superpose spins, which is a problem only solved by golden ratio. So not only is DNA doing this perfect recursion, embedding, uh, nesting, looping, uh, little wave inside the but the, the physics of this is triggered specifically by the geometry of hydrogen. And this was, so it was called braiding DNA. So that's the end of this section about, look, the fractality of hydrogen is central not to just energy, but it's central to water, and it's central to why, why DNA, how DNA, enables us to get a soul. Okay. Good so, timing, Ben. Yeah, excellent timing. Because uh, do you want to summarize, and then we can, if you want, and then we'll open up. We've got 10 minutes. Or so. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, okay, so short summary. Short summary, that was the background about hydrogen as fractal and perfect antenna. Obviously, the only perfect antennas are the un in the universe are the ones that are implosive. So the fractality of that antenna. But then the metaphor, as Roger appropriately named this lecture as hydrogen fractal antenna, is also about, okay, guys, now let's, let's get practical and prove we're grounded here. Let's take all that wonderful physics and earn money with it. <laughs> and and uh, it, so then it comes down to the trick that very few understood about Kansius, when he used that, he used a well, he used a spiral antenna, and to design that antenna uh, to be uh, longitudinally propagating coherently, uh, the physics of antenna design is a very sophisticated subject. Not to mention the impedance matching of that antenna to the amplifier. So that's, that's some sophisticated RF engineering, obviously, and there are discussions of whether it's a spiral on a plane or a spiral on a cone, and the answer is either can work, uh, but actually uh, a spiral on the plane may work fine. Uh, and the other trick to know, understanding this is that many RF engineers are not comfortable calling it a longitudinal propagating RF antenna, because most RF engineers are not even comfortable talking about longitudinal EMF, because even uh, in Maxwell's equations, you've got to dig pretty deep, as, as Bearden said, to even understand and talk about longitudinal EMF. So most RF engineers are going to call that circularly polarized. And but circularly polarized is a good way to name because the polarity is continually imploding through center and emerging out the other vector. 
So visualize uh, a double helix rotating and there's a circular polarized vector going through center. So circularly polarized is a more conventional language to introduce the idea of longitudinal EMF. Point being that no matter how you want to use language, you must understand how to propagate an electromagnetic wave compressionally if you want to make it implosive and centripetal and enable you to sing <laughs> to the center of hydrogen. And remember, the center of every hydrogen bond, when it's perfectly settled, relaxed, and embedded, because of that fractal longitudinal physics, is a radio wave to the center of the universe. End of talk. Thank you, Dan. Look, if you've got some questions, I know there's a couple of questions in the chat window, but you can essentially just unmute yourself, or if you want to raise your hand, and I'll unmute you. Uh, so let's do some questions, guys. Uh, let's Roger. see. Can you hear me? Cool. Yeah, we can hear you, Dan. Don't worry. Oh. I may have the honor of asking the first question since uh, Dan keeps referring to my work. Yes. By the way, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about DNA in my lecture because Roger asked me to talk about water. Okay. Cool. Uh, but uh, the, the question I have is uh, what exactly are those frequencies of the hydrogen bond and how do you think exactly the hydrogen bond is a precursor to consciousness? And, and would those frequencies actually elevate consciousness if broadcast onto a human? Yeah, well, well, thank you for asking a light question. <laughs> <laughs> No, Glenn, Glenn is the heart of the matter here. He's right there. Well, I mean, theoretically, obviously, if you took those radii of those three hydrogen radii in angstroms and divide by the speed of light, you get the frequencies. You know, obviously, microwave very high frequency at that point. But if you take that cascade, the, what the new proof was my discovery that the critical frequency, it was in the 15 megahertz range, and the cascade we don't publish because we want to have to use it as a bit of a secret sauce, but the actual trigger frequency Kansas used was in the megahertz range, and we're, we're proposing to turn that also into a cascade, exactly golden ratio times Planck in the megahertz range. And the point being that then in the slide wherein I showed those predict not only the Schumann harmonics, but the alpha beta brainwave harmonics, we have measured repeatedly cause bliss, flameandmind.com, and we now have much documentation. This is how children learn to see without their eyes the same frequencies. So therefore, we're quite clear what consciousness is. I think there's no ambiguity at all, and people are saying, what is the physics of consciousness? The answer is staring them in the face. It's a plasma vortex imploding through Planck, obviously, as we have said many times. You know, the kid said, oh, I had my eyes closed, I went to this trance state, and then I saw a tube, a wormhole vortex open inside my head, and that tornado had an eyeball, and that's how the kids see through their eyes. That's the first time we ever had clear indication of what consciousness is. And for the first time, we actually know for sure why it was when Bill Tiller measured dozens of ways, focused human attention causes charge to compress. We now know why, because it's an imploding plasma vortex. And we're the first ones who can answer the question, where did the medical doctors see from when they were outside their body in medical surgery looking at the surgery from outside their body? We know exactly how they got out there and how they saw themselves. Who else has a physics of consciousness theory, plasma vortex is consciousness, that explains why consciousness is centripetal and how your consciousness can go outside your head? We know exactly, and we know what limits it. You can't go inside metal boxes very good because... <laughs> So anyway, we think we understand pretty well, actually. Did I address your question? Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, Ralph, no, go for it. You need to un unmute yourself. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, this is Ralph Wheelie from Portland, Texas. Hello. And if we have, we phone and operate, my wife and I phone and operate, and now phone and operate my water. And uh, we have molecular hydrogen uh, too. But well, we measure the water energy with the ORP meter. Right. And uh, that negative charge, what we understand is living water. Of course, we measure pH in the molecular hydrogen level. 
but uh, uh, the hydration levels is what I, my question would be. The water, the uh, hydrogen antenna, does it produce a water that's very hydrated? Uh, you know. Your interest is beautiful and so appropriate. If I may say, first of all, when you measure redox, you're measuring oxidation reduction potential, uh, ORP, which is essentially related to charge distribution efficiency. But if I may say, here's the smoking gun. Everyone now knows that if you put extra nano hydrogen, hydrogen nanobubbles in that water, you get magic, you get healing, whether it's in the spa or you're drinking. In fact, the Therapy Center in, in uh, Las Vegas, they're clear. You, you know, they're breathing hydrogen nano and they're putting na hydrogen nano in their spa and in their imploder vortex and in their Therapy treated water. And the hydrogen nano bubbles are doing magic everywhere. Why? Because it is so profoundly fractal and conjugate at the atomic level. So that completes the high frequency component of the phase conjugate cascade. So my, I'm just having to make this humble suggestion. You could talk to Josh in Las Vegas about some of the more appropriate economic hydrogen nano bubble generators and add that to your magic. And, you know, then your charge distribution efficiency is solubility. It is uh, hydration. It is bioavailability. That's what it is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, we still got time, folks. Oops, I'm sorry about that, guys. Too many gadgets going here. Hi, Dan. I have a question, Stefan. Um, oh. Have you ever tried the solfeggio frequencies uh, in Cascade? Um, the ratios of three six nine, you know, the one four seven one seven one seven four two five eight two eight five, you know, that type sequence. Have you ever tried that? DNA. Well, um, thank you for asking. You know, when uh, Dan, Dan Burish originally published his Solfeggio hypotheses, he referred to my work. He was very nice. He was a friend. Um, and it resolved that his concept of Solfeggio perfected is golden ratio caspade perfected and nothing else. So Solfeggio was just an introduction, introduction of golden ratio cascading. And, for example, the people talk about the 369 and the Tesla work comments on 369. Um, I, of course, obviously the trinary, the three, is the fact that all periodicity begins with triplets. And that's why DNA codons in the I Ching are. And the nine is very clear in physics. It takes nine plasma donut domains to self-organize in Los Alamos, and that's why you got nine chakras and nine. We have whole lectures and videos, golden mean dot info slash whale dreamers on the plasma physics of nine. And in fact, the advanced galactic culture that just arrived on Ganymede, if you've been tracking Elena Danan, is called the nine. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> but it's you see the point is, it's about plasma physics. It's it's about wave mechanics. It's never ever ever about numerology. And so the, the, all I'm saying is, guys, those who just do numerology, they get lost very quickly. So the difference between numerology and physics is when the, the, the ratio of the numbers predicts what a wave is going to do. And we know exactly what that means in the 369, for example, and we know exactly what that means in Solfeggio because it's just an introduction to golden ratio cascading. That's all I'm saying. Well, it's like vortex math is based off of nines and, what? you know, the 369. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I've yeah. been programming that and getting interesting results. Well, it's uh, great. Like a spinning, mer spinning Merkaba yes. brain and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, Marco Rodin, who did the nine stuff, he's an old friend and a very sweet guy. And he's a poet and an artist who never quite figured out the difference between numerology and physics really sweet guy, but if, for example, you take one of his coils, if you could do an accurate spectrum analysis and you could actually make a symmetry map of the flux geometry, then you could imp optimize for implosion. But he doesn't know what those words mean. So sometimes, I, sometimes I find, there's... <laughs> I, find, I find using your voice connected to a multi octaver singing to the tones and sliding you can create the oscillations in between the notes. Yeah, it's right. And that's that's where, uh, when I use the applied technologies with the butt growing plasma devices, um, 
I'll run the programs and then use my voice to create the oscillations and where you want to go with the normal body. It, it, so, that's beautiful. And it is about creating the right heterodyne. Absolutely. You know, the ITC channels are doing radio communication with the dead regularly. And for them, it's all about the right heterodyne. And the reason that works is because that's how you grab a hold of a little bit of the longitudinal interferometry, which is ancestor memory, long song lines, and all that stuff, heaven. And, and so get, play, explain with, playing with that cascading, that's why John Dee was playing with scintillations in light to phase conjugate when he was trying to call angels. Yeah, I've definitely um, opened up many portals and dimensions through my technologies, very similar to stopping time and uh, other, you know, realms and poltergeist uh, level six. And, well, you know, I've, I've had to clean it up. You know, I'm like a part of the kind of cleanup crew uh, from the Mantis. And, um, Oh. And that's where we know each other, I'm sure. But anyways, <laughs> thank you for sharing. Well, that, that's great. I, I really am, and we need people like you out there desperately. That's great. I would just gently encourage a little more electrical engineering, like where's the power spectra? How does it fit the equation? And then also another little part of this is uh, the astral hygiene, even where John D screwed up. You know, it's very fine to call the ancestors, but, you know, the aboriginals would never do that except without a very focused circle of intent. Otherwise, you don't sort out the good guys and the bad guys coming through I'm, the same DNA radio. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm only going for the... Hey, guys, um, thanks. I've got, to, I've got to sort of cut you off there because... That's fine. We, have, we had fun. We've run out of time. Yeah, and, thank you, Roger. Uh, All good. So just as a little summary, the hydrogen project, uh, we are, you know, uh, we do need to set up a, a little bit more equipment, the usual story if you're interested. I've got a document here that I can uh, send you and it gives you a, a little bit more detail into the hydrogen uh, antenna project. And per usual, we're always uh, open to investment to keep moving this forward. You know? we've, done, um, we've, done, we've made a lot of good headway. Um, within that, we discovered also not what to do, and now we know, which is very, very important in r and and now we know what to do. So we really are clear about our next step. And we have and many, many ways uh, forward. We've got a powerful emerging hydrogen economy. People are spending billions of dollars on conventional electrolysis, you know, billions of dollars. I mean, how boring is that? I mean, come on, I think we can exactly. be better than conventional electrolysis. Exactly. And thank you to Roger so for pioneering guys. it. Thank you. So, um, thank you very much, Dan. That's uh, that's great. Uh, I'm going to 